Well, praise God. This morning, um, uh, just as we get into the Word, uh, last week, I actually, or two weeks ago, because last week was off due to the weather, but a couple weeks ago, we started talking a bit about values as a church. Um, we're going to continue with that. One of the values we started on, if we can bring up our value slide, um, and there's going to be more values added, but these are our main core values as a church, and so we'll bring that up. Father, I thank you, Lord, this, uh, this morning, God, that you are uh, going to minister to us, God, in areas where our hearts need to be renovated, Father. We want to be changed uh, because in changing us, we can go further and into our destiny in every way, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we had to uh, just bring up these values here. Uh, we, we, we're a church that we believe in relational discipleship, and that's why small groups are so important to us, uh, because we believe that, you know, on Sunday morning, you're receiving a lot of information. When you go to your small group, you're talking about how to process that information into your life. And so uh, we really believe that's a strategy that God has given us to do relationships when we do discipleship. Next one is excellence. We, we believe we want to do everything to the best of our ability. We want to have a nice facility. We want to, have, we want to come prepared. We want to do things. Not, we're not looking for perfection, but we're, we're giving God our best. Amen? We believe we have to do that. And uh, the third one is servant leadership, uh, was what I talked about a couple weeks ago. I'm going to continue today. Uh, presence-driven worship is very important to us as a church. We believe that the presence of God is the most important thing in worship. Amen? Because God dwells among the praises of his people, and there can be a tangible experience with God's presence, and that's what changes lives. You know, I was at a service once um, years ago, and uh, the Holy Spirit started moving, and, and I had brought a friend who had never been to church, someone who had not experienced, and they just kind of like, yeah, I'll check this thing out, and they're standing beside me. And during the worship, there was like a wind that blew through that place, and people were shaking and jerking and falling down and laughing and everything, and I'm sitting there going, I had my head down, I'm going to be honest, going, what is she going to think? She's going to think we're all crazy, right? I'm like, God, if you had to show up, you should have did it when she wasn't here. She's going to think I'm a nut. And, you know, I'm just, honestly, I was just sitting there, and I lift up my head, and I turn to look at her, and she's weeping and weeping and weeping. And she looked at me, and she goes, I don't know what this is, but I want it. Because God's presence showed up, and so we can never be ashamed of the presence of God. We can never be ashamed of lifting up holy hands and dancing and shouting before God, because it's the presence of God that draws people. Amen? I think it's Acts chapter 15. It says, God wants us to rebuild the tabernacle of the tent of David, just because God wants a place of worship, and people are going to be drawn in from all over the place. Amen? We're, uh, we believe in extraordinary, uh, extraordinary generosity. We want to give with extravagance, amen, because God is a giver, so we want to be like him. Uh, we believe in character and honor, and we also believe in total healing, spirit, soul, and body. So these are some of the things we value as a church, and um, there's more to that, but that's where we're starting. And so today I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the core value of servant leadership, Amen. Now, we can, uh, churches and ministries and families can sometimes be built around uh, strong personalities, can be built around programs, structure, but a church family organization that's built around core values will stand the test of time. Why? Because you agree to something. So this, is where we, this is where we stand as, as a people, and it becomes about the values that God has. Amen? So we want to be a church that focuses on values. I want to talk about Israel. The Hebrews, when they were, um, they were in slavery under the hand of uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, they were slaves, they, 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 they had to work for the Pharaoh, they had to uh, slave, they had to build houses for him, they, they had to build his buildings, and they didn't have proper food, things were, things were not good for the people, but they had a prophetic word, a promise from their forefathers... Abraham and the rest of them, saying that God is going to deliver you and take you out of this land, take you out of captivity, and bring you to a promised land, right? So they had this promise, this prophetic promise, that God was going to deliver them and take them to a new place. And um, God will deliver you out of Egypt. And if you got saved, if you've, if you've accepted the Lord, it's like you were taken out of the devil's camp, out of Pharaoh's camp, out of the world system, and you've been delivered, and God has taken you to, on a journey to the abundant life. 
The promised land is not in heaven. The promised land is the abundant life of happiness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. God wants you to live in abundance. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life in abundance. God wants you to be happy. Amen? He wants you to be fulfilled. And he has a way of doing that. So we're going to talk about that this morning as we look at this. So God will deliver you out of Egypt, and he'll take you to the promised land. But there's a problem. In the process, say in the process, there's sometimes temptation that comes. And the temptation that comes is the temptation to complain on the way to the promise. So God's taken you from Egypt. He's taken you to the promised land. And the enemy will come and tempt you to complain and murmur and say, this doesn't look like God. This isn't what I was promised. Why is my life? And you begin to complain and you begin to murmur on the way to the promise. How many know that's not a good thing? That's, that's really not a good thing. And we see this time and time again with the Hebrews. God started part one of the promise. I will send a deliverer to take you out. Part two of the promise was, you're going to go to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. But between part one and part two, they start to complain. They start to murmur. Okay? Um, but I want to say this. Okay? There's always a process to test you. Why? To prepare you to shoulder the responsibility that comes with the blessing. There's a process of preparation that God has you in because he's trying to prepare you to carry the responsibility that comes with the blessing. And, and sometimes Christians want to kick off the responsibility or the process and complain all the way through it. It's kind of like this. When I was uh, 15, my parents said, um, there's two ways you can do this thing. You want to get your license. You can go take a test. And in taking the test, you know, uh, it's going to cost so much, not too much. But you just go write the test, study yourself, go write the test. But your insurance will be 30% more because they want to see that you've taken a process of schooling. So I don't know what they have now, but they had Young Drivers of Canada at the time. Okay? And if I could get someone to get me some water, that'd be great. Young Drivers of Canada. Okay, so I, I, I went to take Young Drivers of Canada. It was, I don't know, 700 bucks or something. And I went to take this, uh, I went to take this course. Thank you, brother. So I went to take the course, and it cost me a bit of money. But my insurance dropped 30%. Why? Because I was willing to go through the process to prepare me for the blessing of driving on the streets. And the day I got my license, I remember it was like the next day I was at work with my dad working in a machine shop on a Saturday. I said, Dad, hey, do you want me to go to the burger joint and get us some fries? Can I take your truck? He's like, sure, son. So I get in his truck, and I drive to the burger joint. I'm getting French fries, and I come out, sitting in my dad's truck, nice truck, put it in reverse, I'm about to back up, and this attractive young girl walks in front of the truck. She smiles at me, and I'm like, smiling, and I, I think I'm cool now, because I got a car. So I'm reversing quite quickly to show her I'm, I know what I'm doing, while I'm looking at her and waving, and next thing I hear, boom, crash. And I hit like a Cadillac. Like this Cadillac was, I think it was a Cadillac. It was some really nice car. I try to forget. So uh, it came in behind me, and I took the side of the car out. And I was like, man, first day with my license. Go back. Of course, my insurance goes up 30%. So the point is I shouldn't have taken it. No. Um, but how many know there's a preparation process for the blessing? Amen? And so... Um, during our journey to the promised land, you got to remember this. Israel was only supposed to, the Hebrews were only supposed to be on a journey for 40 days. And it became a 40-year journey. It was 40 days from, 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 from Egypt to the promised land. But it seemed like they, they failed the test, failed the test, failed the test. So God just kept, okay, I'll give you the test again. I'll give you the test again. I'll give you the test again. Then the whole lot of them died off. And then, well, I'll start testing your kids. And when, the, when they began to pass the test, God was able to move them into their inheritance. To carry the responsibility that God had for them. Okay. So I want to look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, because as these people are going through the desert, guess what? They became hungry. And in becoming hungry, 
They needed food. They started complaining. They wanted some meat. They wanted some food. And look what God says in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them. See the word test? Whether they will walk in my law or not. And so God is testing them not to disqualify them, but to qualify them for the anointing. He wants to qualify them. He, they're in boot camp. They're going, through, they're going through the survivor. You see what I'm saying? God's taking them on a 40-day journey. He's preparing them to carry a mantle so they can go in and inherit the land. And he says, I've got to test these guys, and I've got to see if they're going to be obedient to me. And he's testing them to see if they're going to take what they're told to take, because if you take extra, it's going to go bad. And so God is testing them to see what they're going to do. All right? And so let's look at what the people did. We're going to go to um, Numbers. I'm going to look at this same story from another perspective. Numbers chapter 11. It says here, Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused, so the fire of the Lord burned among them, and consumed some on the outskirts of the camp. Some of the outskirts of the camp. And so, so when we complain, the Lord, it angers the Lord. The Lord doesn't like complaining. How many see that? So the people complained, and then all of a sudden, the Lord is angry. He sends fire on the outskirts of the camp. I went to California one year. I landed in Los Angeles, had to drive down to San Diego. And uh, it was middle of the night. They're all sleeping in the car. And down the side of a mountain is coming this, this fire. It was like a line of fire, and it was moving fairly quickly. And they were shutting down the highways. And I'm like, that fire is going to catch up. It was scary. This is when we were having the wildfires. What year was it we went down there? It was a few years back. But it was, it, it's amazing to watch how fast fire will move. And it was consuming everything. And God's angry. And the same fire that, that, that led them at night, the pillar of fire, is now God is releasing barbecues all around the people. He's upset. Look at look what the people do. And then the people cried out to Moses. And when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called, in the, name, he called the name of the place uh, Tabarath, because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. But verse 4, Now the mixed multitudes who were among them yielded to intense cravings. So the children of Israel also wept and said, Who will give us meat to eat? So there was a mixed multitude. There were people in the congregation that were giving in to intense cravings and saying, Who's going to give us meat? We're tired of this manna. I mean, I don't understand that. God's sending fire, and they're sitting there looking at the fire going, okay, we got a barbecue, now we need some meat. Like, they just don't get it. And look what they said here. We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt. We remember the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. That's it. And, and I want you to get this because this is a temporary solution that God is giving them. He's not saying you've got to eat manna for the rest of your life. This is temporary. This is part, you're in survival camp here. You're in boot camp. You're being prepared, and, and I'm testing you. And instead of just saying, you know, I don't prefer this. How many teach your kids that? My wife teaches our kids that. You don't say, I don't like this when you're eating. You say, I don't prefer this, right? So instead of saying, Lord... I don't prefer this, but I'm thankful anyway because you're at least, I'm not dying. What do they do? They grumble and complain. Not knowing that God has taken them to a place flowing with milk and honey. There's lots of meat there. They don't have to be vegetarians. They can go to this new place. And there's a process. And they're kicking against it. Okay? Um, let's move on. Now, the manna was like coriander seed. It's color like the color of uh, bdellium. And the people went around and gathered it. Okay, They grounded it on millstones, beat it in mortar, cooking it in pans and making cakes of it. And its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. That sounds pretty good. Like a donut. Like a croissant. Croissant. 
And I understand you get up in the morning, you'd prefer to have, you'd prefer to have meat and onions and garlic. I understand. But you know what? I understand how these people felt because I have French relatives. And every time I go to Quebec and wake up in the morning, I want bacon and eggs. And what is there? Croissant. There is pastries made with olive oil. And I'm thankful. I say, thank you for the pastries, even though I don't prefer them. A part of my French has kind of dwindled off. I, the pastries are not my favorite. But you know what? Thank you anyway. But instead, they complain and they murmur about the pastries. Okay? Now, I want to say this. When you're faithful through the process, you're preparing yourself for the promise. When you're faithful through the process of God, you're preparing yourself for the promise. And here was a group of people that they weren't faithful in the process, and the promise was withheld from them. Amen? Um, and here's, here's, I'll give you something real practical. How do you know that you're faithful to the process? How many want to know? How do you know you're faithful to the process? I'm going to show you right now in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It doesn't mean you have to give thanks for everything that happens in your life, because sometimes the enemy is attacking, and we understand that. But, but we need to find a way that in every situation, we're able to say, God, I know this sucks. I know I don't have the answer. I know even a loved one just passed away, and I don't know why we were praying for them. But you know what? I love you, and I thank you for find something to thank God for. In every situation, find a way to be thankful to God. And in being thankful to God, guess what happens? You're, you, you're faithful in the process. You prepare yourself for the promise. Amen? If you're faithful in the process, you prepare yourself for the promise of God over your life. Amen? You refuse to complain. You just refuse to. I know that things are bad in my life. I know I just lost my job. I know that I, my relative is sick. I, there's bad things happening. But God, I just thank you that you're in control. I don't see the end from the beginning. But God, I love you. I trust you. I'm going to believe you. And you find a way to be thankful in the situation, not for this, but in the situation. Give thanks to God in some way, and you will pass the test every time. You will prepare yourself for the blessing. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. Don't yield to the temptation to complain in the midst of the process because it disqualifies you for the promise. This is okay. God is calling us to be this kind of people. All right? So they're complaining. They're complaining about God. They're complaining to Moses. And I want to look at Moses' response. To the people, and, and uh, we're going to go to Numbers chapter eleven, verse ten. And then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused, and Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, "Why have you afflicted your servant?" All right. Next verse. Why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Did I give birth to them? Are they my kids? Did I, nur uh, did I nurse them? Well, there's a million people. Did I actually, did I take, did I give birth to them? Are they my kids? Why are you giving them? Why am I their guardian? What's going on? Next verse. The land which swore to your fathers where I am to get meat. Where am I going to get meat to give all of these people? Because they weep all over me. Moses, we want food, help us, Moses, Moses. And he's just like, he's losing it. He's at the place of burnout. How many have been to a place of burnout? Just like, leave me alone, leave me alone. Next verse. <clears throat> I'm not able to bear the burdens of all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. For if you treat me like this, please kill me, God. Hear it now. If I found any favor in your sight, just kill me and don't let me see my wretchedness. I mean, he's at the place of just total, like, I can't carry the weight. I can't carry the burden. I can't carry the responsibility alone 
anymore. These people are complaining. These people are murmuring. They're not thankful. They're not grateful. They don't see the process of God. They just, they're just, and you know, the thing is, they grew up as slaves. It's all they knew was slavery. And now they're being held accountable for their actions. And they don't know what to do with it. And Moses is fed up. So what does the Lord say? Do you want to know what the Lord said? The Lord always has an answer, doesn't he? Let's see what the Lord says in Numbers chapter 11, verse 16. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, who you know to be elders of the people. These are people who are shepherds. They have a servant's heart. Say a servant's heart. They're leaders in the kingdom. And look what it says here. You know that they're leaders of the people and they're officers. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. Okay, the tabernacle of meeting was where God would meet with the presence of God and God would speak to him. Then I will come down and I will talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you. I will put the same spirit upon them so that they shall bear the burdens of the people with you so that you may not bear it alone. And so I want to say this. God is saying when when there's burden, when there's responsibility, God is saying what I'm going to do because it's not by strength, it's not by might, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. I'm going to take the spirit that's upon you and I'm going to put it on 70 other servants and they're going to be able to carry the burden with you. I want to say this. the, The whole idea of the anointing and the empowerment of God is not just for you to have a tickle. The purpose of the anointing is so that you can carry the burden. Do you hear what I'm saying? That word burden is translated responsibility. And so we got Christians today that run from conference to conference, meeting to meeting, and, and, and it's not wrong to go and enjoy the presence of God, but that's all they do, but they don't commit, they don't serve, they don't plug in, and so they're wasting their time because God will only pour his empowerment upon those who are willing to carry a burden. Hallelujah. And so what God is doing is he's raising up a people who say, listen, I want to serve. I don't care if I'm just washing toilets or if I'm serving in the kids' ministry or I'm on the worship team or I'm going and helping at a soup kitchen somewhere or going on a mission, whatever. I want to serve God because when I serve, God sees you and he says, I'm going to put my spirit upon you. Amen? That's what God is after. So there was a burden that was too heavy for Moses. And God says, I'm going to do something. Because if you're faithful in the process, you're prepared for the promise. Let's say that together. If you're faithful in the process, you're preparing for your promise. But this is also true. If you're not faithful in the process, you become a burden to the body. Amen? Amen? They were complaining, Moses, Moses, help us, Moses, you know, God is not faithful, you're, you're not taking care, and they're complaining, 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 and they became a burden, such a burden to Moses that he wanted to kill himself. And I believe that we're a church, we're servant leaders, we're saying, God, we're here to serve you in whatever capacity you have for us, and God's going to pour out his spirit not just upon Pastor Travis, he's going to pour out his spirit and power upon all of us, so that together we can carry the burden of the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. But there's still a burden. Whether it's light, there's still a responsibility in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? All right. So here's what the Lord says. He tells him to get 70 people together. Now let's look at verse 24 to 25. You guys okay for a few more minutes? All right. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people, and he placed them around the tabernacle. And then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to them and took of the spirit that was upon Moses and placed it on the 70 elders. There's actually a typo here because there was only 68. We'll get to that. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. One of the signs of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for service is prophecy. And in the New Testament, it's tongues and prophecy. Amen? And so when you see the Spirit of God come, people begin to prophesy the word of the Lord because the Spirit and the word agree. And so the Spirit of God came upon 68 men 
because two of them didn't get the memo. We'll read on. Verse 26. But two men had remained in the camp. Two of the, the, the 70. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. If I had a name like that, I'd probably stay away too. And the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, the 70, but had not gone out to the tabernacle. Yet they prophesied in the camp. Because they were servants of God, do you guys see this? Because they were elders and they were chosen, they didn't get the memo, or for whatever reason they didn't show up, only 68 men came. They were away from the tabernacle doing their own thing, and, and the Lord said, oh, there's two. See, it's not about where you are, it's where your heart's at. When God's pouring out his spirit, so many people think it's about where I'm at. i got to be at this place at this time to meet with God. No, you have to have your heart right. And God will fall on you wherever you are. People say, yeah, I can't. I've heard this in the past. Well, if I'm serving in the kids' ministry, when we have a special speaker, I'm going to miss out on the anointing. No, God's anointing will fall on you wherever you're at. You're going to go home and have dreams and visions. You're going to have prophetic revelation. Why? Because you have the heart of a servant. I'll give you a perfect example of that. Last month, we had Charlie Sweet come. And I said to Charlie, pray that God will give you... you know, I didn't have to tell him this because he doesn't. But he's praying for the leadership of the church and the members of our church, of our body. And then he comes and he stands up, turns around and goes, is Paulette here? I said, actually, no, she's on vacation with her husband. Well, I have a word. Can I give it? Sure. And he gave one of the most accurate words of that whole weekend, didn't he not? And so Paulette is part of the body. She's called of the Lord. Her and Owen have a servant's heart. They give, 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 give. They serve, 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 serve. And many of you do the same. And God shows up and says, oh, they're not here, but I'm still going to get them what I want to give them because they're called of God. And they're over in Dominican Republic. And I called you afterwards and I played the message and did it not minister to you. <laughs> Amen. So what happens is God will not forget you. God will pour out his spirit on servants. Isn't that good news? They forgot, didn't get the memo, I don't know what happened there. But they were burden carriers, so God says, we're not going to forget me, dad, and the, elder, the other guy. God chooses the ones who are looking to carry the responsibility of the kingdom. And then we look down to verse 27. So we got me, dad, and Eldad prophesying in the camp. And everybody's saying, no, they can't prophesy. They're not part of the 70. Well, they were. But they're not at the tabernacle. Nobody prophesies in the camp. And, and they're complaining. A young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and me, dad, are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, uh, one of his choice men, he, he answered and said, Moses, my Lord, you need to forbid them from prophesying. They're not part of the group. And look what Moses says. Are you jealous for my sake? The word zealous means jealous. This is verse 29. Are you jealous for my sake? You're trying to protect my precious anointing? Look what Moses says. Oh, that all God's people were prophets, and oh, that the Lord would put his spirit upon all of them, because then they'd finally get it, those knuckleheads. Moses is saying, my desire and God's desire is that all the children, the nation of Israel, would be kings and priests in relationship with God. They, he, they, he, God didn't want an in-between. God didn't want a religious system. But the people said, hey, we're scared of God's presence. So, God, it's okay. You, Moses, you go talk to God, and then you come and tell us what he's saying to us. And how many know that wasn't God's plan? God wanted to have an intimate relationship with all of the people who would call upon his name. All right? When you're faithful through the process, you're preparing for your promise. And all of us are at a place in our life where we're going through a process, and we need, need to learn to be faithful. And say, Lord, I choose to rejoice. I choose, I'm praying. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. That's a, that's a hard one. Have you ever thought about that? I had three situations just in the last week and a half where I had I, anxieties were like, whoo, like coming to the surface. And I was able to just come before the Lord and say, Lord, I, 
I'm going to give this to you. Your, Bible, your word says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. So God, I'm going through a tough time in this situation. I'm giving it to you, and I'm going to put on a smile. Thank you that it's sunny today. I thank you that it's raining and my car is full of ice. <laughs> that was when it happened. And it was like the burden lifted. How many hear what I'm saying? Did the situation still suck? Absolutely. But I felt like I'd leave it at the foot of the cross. And when you do that, then God steps in and he begins to take care behind the scenes, begins to take care of the problem. But if we complain, then we got to take care of the problem. Wow. So, let's go to the New Testament for a second because I want to bring this into the New Covenant. Can we do that? Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Verse 17 and 18. Um, <coughs> Jesus, after he rose from the dead, told his disciples to tarry in Jerusalem. He gave them this great commission to go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize people, right? But he said, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued or overfilled with power from on high. Now, there were already Christians. Because the Bible says that when Jesus came to them, he breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. So they were already Christians. But they weren't empowered to carry a burden. And he said, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high so you can carry the burden of the kingdom and go into all the world with the gospel. Okay? This is what he's basically saying. And I want to ask you this question. Do you think those 120 were there just to receive and, and meet with God? Or do you think they were there on assignment? I think it was both. Because you, you can't have assignment without relationship. But we forget that. They were there waiting. Okay, we, got, we were told, go into all the world. We were told to go with the message. We're supposed to lay hands on the sick. We're supposed to do all this. But, but we're waiting for something. And when the Spirit of God came within just that quick, they were out onto the streets. They were preaching. 3,000 people were added to the church. There was this move of God that happened. And so many times as Christians, if we're not careful, we'll have a meeting just for the sake of having a meeting, right? And we just get together. And we can actually do this at home. I don't know if any of you do this. You can put on a worship CD, and you can, or you can, and you can worship, and you can pray, and you can experience the presence of God. And, and that's amazing. And then we come to church, and we see our fellowship together as just that. But it's more than that. It's a group of people getting together saying, God, we're called here to carry a burden, to carry the responsibility of the kingdom. You've called us to be leaders, just like you did with Moses' 70s, and you want to put your spirit upon me for service. And so, this is what happened. The spirit of God fell in the book of Acts, and then chapter 2, verse 17. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Peter says, It shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Moses' is wish is coming to pass. Oh, that God, you'd pour out your spirit on all people so that they wouldn't be knuckleheads and they'd understand how this thing works. And this is what he's saying right here. He's saying, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. Isn't that good? All flesh. The only thing you need is to position yourself to be a burden carrier and say, Lord, I'm going to carry. I'm going to be yoked together with you. Your yoke is easy, but your burden is light. And together, we're going to work together in partnership. And we're going to carry the ministry of Christ to Trenton. We're going to find any capacity that we can serve in because when we make ourselves a servant, God empowers us with his spirit. Amen? So if you're faithful in the process, guess what happens? If you're faithful in the process, you prepare yourself to receive the promise of God. If you're not faithful in the process, you become a burden to the body of Christ. And I'm thankful that we have a a church here at the crossroads, and I believe really 
want to carry the burden of the kingdom and want to press through the process of God. Amen? And that's why we do stuff like encounter weekends. And we're starting actually in the end of June. We haven't advertised yet, but we're going to have our, our course. It's going to be like a second encounter. We're not going to call it an encounter because um, Peter doesn't like that. <laughs> can't call it an encounter. And you're right. We can't because it's, it's something else. But it's called Highway to Wholeness, and it's going to be three days of teaching on how to renew the mind and bring healing to mind, spirit, and body. So the church can walk in, in victory and walk in health so we can be can we can give it away and we can reach the lost and we can pray for the sick. Amen? So that's one of the things we want to do. And so one last scripture, 1 Timothy 4, verse 14 to 15. 1 Timothy 4, verse 14 to 15, it says this. Paul is speaking to Timothy. He says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy. I'm going to tell you something. You know, we prophesy over one another all the time. Did you know if you're a believer, you can prophesy? You can speak into someone's life and encourage them and edify them and build them up. Okay? Um, but when we have someone from the office of the prophet come in and speak words, they're... they're th- there's a, there's a different heaviness and weight that comes with it. We've had quite a few. We have Gary Hayes coming next couple of weeks from now. Uh, he's coming in two weeks. Yeah, May 6th. So be part of that. But we had Charlie Sweet come. And Charlie Sweet spoke into people's lives. And the pattern that I've seen in the last three years is that when people came in from a prophetic office and prophesied over people's lives, that I would get reports back within two months to six months saying, that word has already come to pass in my life. Or it's in the process you know, when it came and prophesied, you will have a baby. Yeah, I'm pregnant all of a sudden. You know, like there's a weight that... So I want to say, do, do, don't neglect the gift that is in you, which was given by prophecy with the laying on the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. And I want you to say this next verse with me. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. So if you get a prophetic word that you're called to be a Bible teacher, for example... Well, don't just wait for God to open some mysterious door and connect you with somebody. Start studying the Bible. Start enrolling in courses and study and begin to prepare yourself. Give yourself over to that. If it bears witness with you, of course, that your progress may be evident. Use that promise. Keep your eye on the promise. And I think if the children of Israel would have kept their eye on the promise of God that was given to their forefathers, saying that you are going to inherit a land in 40 days, I would say, you know what? I'm going to suck it up, buttercup. I'm going to eat this manna, and I'm not going to complain because God wants me to be grateful, and I'm going to make this thing happen quick so I can get to the place God wants me to be. The majority of us, we complain and we murmur. So here's, here's, the, here's the thing. Can I give you an assignment to take home with you? No assignments, eh? Think about everything you think about, okay? Because in everything, give thanks. And so just evaluate this week. Just evaluate your life. And think, when you're praying, think about everything that your life consists of. Your, maybe it's schooling, education, your kids. You know, maybe you're, you're struggling with illness and you need a healing. Whatever it is, think about it and then begin to thank God in that situation. Say, I want to thank you. I'm going to believe you. I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to, and can you do that as an assignment this week? Take everything, write it down, and then begin to thank God for everything that's in your life. The things that are bad that you know are like an attack of the enemy and not of God, thank God that he's going to take you through it. And thank God that he's already healed you, even though the doctor says you're not healed. Say, I thank you that I'm healed, even if I don't feel it yet. And begin to have a mindset of thanksgiving in everything. And what you'll see is your spiritual process in God. You'll start seeing the promises of God fall upon your life. And what could have taken 40 years now has taken 40 days. Can I hear an Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, let's stand together, and we'll close in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you, God, that it's not by strength, it's not by might, but it's by your Spirit. God, I know, Holy Spirit, that you're speaking to all of our hearts. 
We're all in process, God, and you're helping us to see the areas. You're shining your light on the areas of our heart where we have not been grateful and thankful. And I thank you for breakthrough across this congregation in families and in lives, God, as we begin to thank you and put our foot on the head of the devil and say, I'm not going to murmur and complain. I'm going to be thankful because that's a seed of faith in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.